Okay, good morning. So last week we introduced the notion of a probability space and I've recalled some of that definition here. Um, it's a triple omega fp where both f and p satisfy certain axioms. I've only recalled the um, axioms for p here because they are the ones that are kind of most useful and most important while the axioms for f essentially say what I write here makes sense. I can apply the function p to all members of f and so I have to kind of uh, ensure that uh, the union is a member of f if I only assume that a and b are members of f and, and things like that. Right? So, so that was, uh, was our general setup and we had some um, experience with that setup um, showing um, that um, these axioms entail other useful properties that you may expect from a probability um, um, calculation um, of a simple kind so far. But of course this goes much further and will accompany us for, for, for a little while or from time to time, let's say, more or less explicitly. Um, the example that uh, was in the background somewhere because I did it uh, um, the previous lecture um, was the case of a finite omega and what I haven't done but what you can easily do is check that what we defined there as the function p on the set of all subsets of a finite set omega really satisfies the axioms of a probability space. And then um, there was um, something at the end of, of last lecture about countability which um, many of you will have seen before um, but which I um, defined uh, um, just uh, in order to be clear about a few statements that we may gradually um, use in slightly higher generality than, uh, than what, uh, what I've stated so far. But that will become clearer as we go along. So today we're going to discuss conditional probability. So in practice what we may be modeling using, a, using probability is something that we eventually observe but not necessarily um, observe uh, all in one go. And sometimes we observe only part of the um, um, randomness in our, in our probability space and uh, we then have additional information which makes us reassess the probabilities of um, events that we have not yet fully observed. And this is the um, idea of conditional probability, conditionally given that we've observed something, some event let's say to begin with, um, what, how does that impact if other events that may be the actual events of interest for us. So conditional probability Here's a definition. So we take two events, so given a probability space of course, so two events A, B in F where I now want to insist that B has a positive probability. That's in fact what we will suppose we observe. So in that framework we can define the conditional probability of the other event given this b. So the probability of a given b and the definition is probability of a given b, so this is notation for now, um, and then uh, prob the definition is this is the probability of the intersection divided by the probability of B. Okay, so what have we done? We have a probability space. We are interested, say, in an event A. So this is all of omega and we are interested in A and let's suppose we observe um, that uh, actually we are observing an event B. Okay, so if you didn't know that B was true, we've got something left over there, so if you didn't know that B was true then you would think that A is 
very likely compared to B. But now that you know that B is true, what does that tell us about the probability of A? Right? If you know that the actual outcome you are going to observe is somewhere in B, then all of a sudden uh, A looks less likely because it has uh, a smaller proportion of, uh, of, well, area is what I'm using here to represent probability. Right? And then uh, what we've defined is we've said, let's look at how much the intersection of A um, and B, um, how the probability of that relates to the probability of the event B that we suppose we have observed. So that is, for now, is a, is a definition, but uh, we will uh, kind of uh, see that it kind of uh, does what, uh, um, what is useful to us in uh, answering certain questions. Okay, let's maybe start with an example here. A simple example, just rolling a fair dice, uh, one fair die, rather. Not make it more complicated. You can, of course, have examples with several dice as well. We are interested in two events. One event that, uh, well, maybe you are rolling the die and uh, you're not revealing everything to me immediately. So I'm thinking, well, if it's a fair die, then there's a probability of one sixth for every outcome. I'm interested in a six. But you tell me, well, the result is even, right? Then uh, you're giving me some information B that the result is even. And what does that do to my thinking that uh, a six happens with probability one sixth? So A being the event of observing a six then after you've told me the result is even, I'm interested in the conditional probability of A given B. Let's work some things out here. Probability of B is one half. Probability of A is one sixth. But also the probability of A intersection B is one sixth since A intersection B is actually just the singleton event with a six in it as well. And so what are we interested in? We're in, well, I'm interested in my chances of finding a six from your roll of the die. So that now after you've told me it's even is by definition the probability of the intersection divided by the probability of the event we are conditioning on, and so that makes it one third. Which is what you'd expect. If you tell me three of the options are no longer possible, yeah, everything was equally likely. It'll still be equally likely in this setting for the remaining three options, and one of them is the one I'm interested in. So the concept that I've defined here, with this being the probability of the intersection and this being the probability um, that I've conditioned upon, of the event I've conditioned upon, um, the concept does what we want. We can maybe also um, think about what had happened if you told me, ah, it's an odd number. Then, of course, I would have known that my event isn't going to happen, and the conditional probability of A given B complement is zero. And you see something nice happening here. The one-sixth probability of the event overall is kind of an average of the um, probability um, of A given B and the probability of A given B complement, an average of one-third and zero. And we'll get back to that. There's something called the law of total probability, um, which uh, will allow us to, in general, recover probabilities unconditional probabilities of events from various probabilities that are conditional probabilities um, like the ones that we've had here. Okay, so I have to deal with that problem here before I 
um, tell you some consequences of the definition that we've made up there of uh, defining the conditional probability as a ratio of two probabilities. Um, it may sometimes be useful to just take that formula and to multiply through by the denominator. So if we multiply through by the probability of b, then we are getting a product and we are writing the probability of a as the product of the probability of a given b, oh, sorry, the probability of a intersection b, we are writing it as the product of the probabilities of a given b as defined with the probability of b. So um, from the definition, we get that the probability of A intersection B can be written as the probability of A given B times the probability of B. And let me call that star as uh, that will be something that we will refer to later. And if you think that through, if you have several events, then you can repeatedly um, take such, uh, such conditional probabilities and you can similarly express the probability of A1 intersection all the way up to An and write it as the probability of A1 times the probability of A2 given A1 etc times the probability of the final event An given that you've observed all the previous events from A1 up to An minus 1. Okay, how do you prove this? Well, the easiest is to start on the right-hand side and to just think what are each of those conditional probabilities. Each one of them is a ratio and they are ratios of probabilities where you are intersecting what's before and after the conditioning bar um, divided by the um, probability of what's behind the conditioning bar. And then you kind of get a telescoping product where the numerator of the last term is what you end up with because the denominator of the last term is going to be the same as the numerator of the penultimate term, etc. Or if we start at the beginning, this term is going to cancel the denominator of that second conditional probability and its numerator is going to cancel the next denominator um, in the next conditional probability. A more formal proof would be an induction. So proof by induction I leave that as an exercise if you, if you so wish. Okay, yes, so let's, let's have some, some more examples. Well, here's an example about a deck of cards. So if I Take a standard deck of cards, that in particular means that I have um, four suits of 13 cards each. So I'm interested in hearts, hearts being one of the suits. Then um, um, there are 13 cards that are hearts in that standard deck of cards. And I can uh, um, look at events that uh, um, when taking cards from the pack, um, I can look at events about how many hearts I'm getting. So a standard deck of cards So in a standard deck of cards, um, 13 out of 52 are what we refer to as hearts. So what I do is I choose three cards at random. I have to be precise here. I take them uniformly at random and I take them without replacement so that I cannot take the same card twice. Um, 
Okay, so what am I interested in from three cards? If I'm interested in the number of hearts that I get, I can ask, what is the probability that all of them are hearts? Okay. Well, in some way, every set of three cards that I might end up with is equally likely. So, if I have 52 distinguishable cards, we can take the methods from our lecture one about um, equally likely things um, and, uh, and do a calculation um, based on that. Then the solution, let's call it solution one, is omega is my um, set of choices of three cards. Okay, and uh, by symmetry, all outcomes are equally likely. Well, I have to be clear. I didn't say that all the cards are distinguishable because they're also numbered or um, given some other um, funny names. So, um, so they are all, uh, all distinguishable cards. And so that is, uh, is behind this meaning here of, uh, of being equally likely. And the probability of um, our event that we have three hearts is therefore the probability, well, if that is our event A, then we can write it as number of A divided by number of omega. Um, and how many ways are there um, to choose three cards? Uh, well, as far as omega is concerned, how many choices of three cards are there all together? You've got 52 cards, and um, um, there are 52 choose three ways to choose three cards. Whereas in the numerator, we want them all to be hearts, so out of those 13 hearts, um, there are 13 choose three ways of choosing three cards. And that is um, an answer. So that is kind of following um, our Monday of week one, lecture one um, um, reasoning. Um, but there's something going on here which um, feels a bit like, uh, like being conditional probability, because um, what makes this question slightly more interesting than flipping coins repeatedly is that when you draw the first card, you're left with a pack of 51 cards, of which 12 are hearts. And if you pick a second card, and it is another heart, then you have a pack of 50 cards, and only 11 of them are hearts. And that sort of uh, uh, reasoning um, very much pushes you towards, uh, towards an a conditional probability reasoning. So solution two is to say, let's look at the event separately of having hearts in each of the um, um, cards that we draw. So um, we let Si be the event um, that the ith card chosen is a heart. So what are we interested in? We're interested in the first card being a heart, the second card being a heart, the third card being a heart. So that is the intersection of those three events. And it's useful to take them one by one and say, well, we know what the probability is that the first one is a heart. But given that we've observed that, um, it affects the probability of the second one being a heart. So this will then be a conditional probability um, that, we, that we want to calculate. And similarly, we need to condition on the earlier two. Right? Either because of the reasoning that I've just given about what happens to the cards, or abstractly, that's applying this formula um, that, we, that we have to relate those um, 
those probabilities of intersections um, to individual probabilities, which in general are conditional probabilities. So the um, calculation then um, is for each one of those um, with reasoning very similar to what we had up there. So 13 out of 52, once you have taken one out, you are asking to pick any of the 12 out of 51 uh, remaining cards and then 11 out of 50. And uh, of course, you can do some elementary um, manipulations to figure out that those two answers are, in fact, the same answer. OK, so we see that conditional probability in this example is just a different way of uh, doing a calculation of a problem that we could already solve. But there are, of course, more um, advanced applications of conditional probability. In the real world, many things happen with time, and you may just be observing um, a process in time, and you may have to reassess what you think about the chances that a probability uh, of the probability um, of an event in the future that you that you care about. Okay. Now I mentioned on the example here that um, we can think of unconditional probabilities as being averages of conditional probabilities as you vary the event that you condition on, which in that kind of timeline may think the future may turn out one way or it may turn out another way. And um, if it has to be one of two, it's easy, but it could may easily be, um, be lots of different um, possibilities for the future to turn out. Um, and then uh, um, you may have to reassess um, by averaging um, all the possibilities. Um, um, well, in this um, simple case uh, or, or in, in higher generality. Well, let's do the general case. So where was I on the left? No, this is full. No, right. I think my board management is not quite working out here. Um, I think that example I have to sacrifice. So, um, so let me um, start the law of total probability here. So first, the definition. The definition is the definition of what we want to call a partition. And I'm referring back to the notion of um, countable that, uh, uh, no, uh, that's also disappearing up there. No, uh, really, things really don't, <laughs> don't all remain visible as I had hoped. Never mind. Um, I is a countable set here. And I want to call a family B i i in i um, of events. I want to call it a partition. Of our sample space omega, if two things hold, one every outcome is in one of the members of the partition. So the union of those B i's is all of omega. And then second is that uh, they are pairwise disjoint. So B i intersection B j um, is empty whenever i is not equal to j. So that's a partition. And with this notion of a partition, I can state the law of total probability. So here's a theorem, which we refer to as the law of total probability, and abbreviate LTP, or some people call it the partition theorem because a partition will feature in its statement. <clears throat> um, well, I said I was going to go back and forth between um, general countable sets. Um, I should actually say countable somewhere. 
uh, let me maybe add and i is countable, meaning finite or countably infinite. And let me also mention the two examples that are most relevant. We could have b1, b2, etc., a countably infinite set of events, or we could have finitely many like b1, b2, up to bn. That is uh, kind of the, most two, um, the two most important examples of a partition. So now here um, I'm writing the law of total probability um, for i, the natural numbers. That is the first case of, uh, of a partition uh, that, uh, that I wrote here. So in that case, I'm going to state the law of total probability here. So um, in that case, I say I take a partition bi i greater than or equal to 1 is a partition of a sample, uh, prob a sample space omega. Um, and we furthermore suppose that the probability of each of those sets bi is positive. So for each i greater than 1. Then suppose we have another event A. So let me say for all events A, we can work out the probability of A from conditional probabilities where we condition on um, our um, various BIs. So we can then write this as a sum i from 1 up to infinity of precisely those conditional probabilities of a given bi. But each one of them has to be multiplied by the corresponding probability of bi. Right? And in some way, the reason for that is still the starred equation up there, as will become clear in the proof. OK. Let me make some remarks here and also the proof. So let me say there's a condition that the probability of bi is positive. But in the statement itself, it turns out that there is a factor of the probability of bi here which makes the corresponding term zero anyway. So why is it important to suppose that the probability of bi is positive? Well, the reason is that I also wrote a conditional probability which has in its denominator the probability of bi. So I really don't like the zero denominator. But you could have a convention where um, you may still um, want to write this if you say, but the zero here makes the whole term um, zero, kind of as a cancellation of zeros, which is very informal, um, but, uh, but is a useful way of thinking if you remember this form of the law of total probability, um, that you're not really far away from applying it um, for only finitely many bi's with the others having zero probability. So let me write, we don't need to assume probability of bi positive. Um, well, that's not true as it stands, but um, as long as we understand the offending term, probability of a given bi times probability of bi to be 0. OK, and that's one way of saying we actually um, can 
apply the law of total probabilities for other partitions other than partitions into countably infinitely many terms. So the law of total probability holds for all countable partitions. OK, but uh, I've stated it in this way because I want to prove the special case of this uh, um, partition theorem where the argument is most uh, nicely um, attaching to our axioms of probability and also has a, a, a useful generality to, to really exploit the power of our axioms of probability. So here's the proof. So I'm interested in the probability of A. How can I write the probability of A to get anywhere near the right-hand side? If I work backwards, then I can realize that this is the probability of, the A, of A intersection with Bi. And so these A intersection with Bi events somewhere um, appear here. How I, can I make them appear? I can um, say this is A intersection with omega, and omega, because we are starting from a partition, um, can be written as a union of Bi. So I have A intersection with the union, in my case, I from 1 up to infinity, of Bi. Now you know your set theory, and some people ask me at the end of the lecture, what do we need to do if we want to apply set theory results? And the answer is, well, you can just use what you know about set theory. Um, so we are not uh, doing a course on set theory. Um, so what you know about um, intersections of unions, um, you can just write, um, this is the union i from 1 up to infinity of a being intersected with each of the bi's. OK, and now, how, why is that useful? Well, going back to our axioms of probability, we have that third axiom which says that if we have pairwise disjoint events, and we are interested in the probability of the union of pairwise disjoint events, then we can just write this as the sum, infinite sum, of the probabilities of the individual events. So why does this work here? We can certainly refer to axiom P3, but we should also say that um, the A intersection Bi here are disjoint. So why are they disjoint? Because we are assuming the Bi to be disjoint. And that entails that the a intersection bi are disjoint. OK. Now, the final step is that we write this probability of the intersection by this starred formula up there as a product um, exactly of the kind that we have in the statement of the conditional probability of a given bi multiplied into the probability of bi. So we could refer to star, but ultimately, I mean, that sort of reasoning, you may just say, by definition of probability of a given bi, because uh, that's really what it is. We've just uh, done an elementary rearrangement of the definition there. OK, in any case, we've got from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of what we wanted to show. So that is completing our proof. So it's time for, for an example.
So this example is about Henry, Henry having dinner tonight, and uh, with probability 80%, Henry is having um, the dinner provided by college, with probability 20%, Henry is cooking for himself. Now, in college, well, college serves pasta 15% of the time, but if Henry cooks for himself, it's pasta 95% of the time. <laughs> so what is the probability that Henry is having pasta tonight? Right? So let me write it down, and you can think about what the probability is that Henry is having pasta um, with the information that I've given you. So on a given evening, Henry either eats dinner in college with probability 0.8, or he cooks for himself. with the remaining probability of 0.2, of course. So in college, he is served pasta with probability 0.15. When he cooks, It's pasta with probability 0.95. Question, what is the probability that Henry eats pasta tonight? or on the given night, I suppose, but tonight is such a night. Okay, so what have we got? The first thing we are told is event of interest. The event of interest is Henry eats pasta. The others are the partition of our sample space. We have two possibilities. Either Henry eats in college, or if not, as the only other possibility is that Henry cooks for himself. OK. So what are we given as probabilities in the narrative there? Um, well, we are given various things. Um, not the probability that Henry eats pasta, but the pro conditional probability that Henry eats pasta given that he eats in college, or that Henry eats pasta given that um, he cooks for himself. And we are also given the probabilities that he eats in college and that he cooks. The probability that he cooks for himself is a consequence. So the probability that we want to calculate is therefore most naturally calculated using the law of total probability um, from the conditional probability of Henry eating pasta given that Henry eats in college multiplied into the probability that Henry eats in college and um, plus the probability that Henry eats pasta given that he cooks for himself times the probability that he cooks for himself. Okay. So all of those being given, we just collect the bits and pieces. Cooking uh, in college, serve pasta with probability 0.15. Probability of eating in college is 0.8. Then um, with probability 95%, he eats pasta when cooking for himself. And that's multiplied into the probability of actually cooking for himself of 0.2. And so if you put all this together, you find 
the chances of Henry eating pasta today is 0.31, 31%. Okay. So one can often, with conditional probabilities, one can turn things round and ask, well, in this context, given that Henry eats pasta, what's the probability um, that he cooked for himself? Right? Kind of um, probability that uh, B2 occurs given that A occurs. So that would be, would be a question that, uh, that we can also try to answer. But let me do that in, uh, in general. So let me um, talk about what's called Bayes' theorem. So it's very much the framework we're in. We have some partition b i, i in i. And we again want to condition on each of those b i events. So we assume that the probability of b i is positive for all i in i. And suppose we have another event A as before, but now let's also suppose that the, that probability is positive so that we can also condition on A, also have A behind the conditioning bar. Then, well, what does the theorem say? The theorem says the probability for any of those BK events to be the event that actually um, occurred um, given that we've observed A, um, that can be written as a ratio where the numerator has the um, conditioning reversed. That's the idea of Bayes to um, swap the sides of the conditioning. But of course, these are not equal. We have to kind of undo things um, to um, get a correct formula. And the way to do that is to multiply by the probability of BK in the numerator and then to normalize by the sum of all of those numerators, now summing over i, those quantities, probability of A given bi times the probability of bi. That's Bayes' theorem. Um, well, the proof, let me be a little sketchy here. Um, what you do is you start on the left-hand side and you say, what is that? Well, by definition, it's just the probability of BK intersection with A divided by the probability of A. Now, the probability of A, that's this, right? The law of total probability tells you you can write your, condition, your probability of A in terms of all these conditional probabilities in that way. And, well, the numerator, that's just this, right? By the star formula that we still have up there, just multiplying through by the denominator in the definition of conditional probability, right? So, um, so this um, is, um, is telling us that this formula is true. It's not the nicest formula, and my view on this is, don't learn that one by heart. Um, but remember how you derive it, because this really is quicker than, uh, than the formula itself. But let's apply it. I introduced this in the context of Henry. What's the probability that Henry cooked for himself, given that he had pasta? Um, well, that's what we can now do. So in the example, given that Henry Hard pasta, what is the probability that he cooked for himself? Okay, we've got the Notation from down there, so the probability that he cooked for himself. 
given that he had pasta, is probability of B2 given A by the formula. This is the probability of A given B2 times the probability of B2 divided by that sum over our countable partition. Our countable partition, um, um, maybe I didn't say, but this is our partition of two sets into two sets. So for that partition, taking that sum just means you take the probability of A given B1 times probability of B1 and add the probability of A given B2 times the probability of B2. And so from the calculation up there, well, I didn't put the intermediate step, but if I had multiplied 0.95 more explicitly by 0.2, I would have written 0.19, and that is what my numerator <coughs> is going to be. And then the 0.12 plus 0.19 is what my final line up there gave me as 0.31. <coughs> so we see the probability of Henry cooking for himself, given that he had pasta, is 19 over 31. And of course, it's all pretty arbitrary here with the numbers and everything. Um, but there's one thing to note, which is that the probability of Henry cooking for himself was pretty small with only 20% of the time him cooking for himself. This conditional probability actually is pretty large, right? It's greater than a half. And so these conditional probabilities really can make a difference. And uh, it's important to, to be clear if anything given to you is a conditional probability or an unconditional probability. That will make a big difference in general. And what I said about Henry um, here is just one way of interpreting things. Um, we could have um, given a completely different story to the same numbers. And you've all gone through COVID over the last couple of years. And you can just uh, think, well, whenever there's two possibilities, Henry cooking for himself, Henry not cooking for himself, on the one hand, and eating pasta, not eating pasta, well, any kind of all four combination goes is possible. So what could we have? You having COVID, you not having COVID is, is one distinction. And uh, the other being you had a positive test or you didn't have a positive test. Right? And so, um, so if you translate things and allocate the numbers, you can kind of just uh, reinterpret this answer as just being a conditional probability of having COVID given that your test was positive. And all of a sudden it has a much more uh, important flavor. And indeed, uh, on the problem sheet, you will, you will look into some, uh, some of those, um, those medical um, applications of these ideas of conditional probability. So where does that leave us? With one minute to go, one and a half. Well, let me just write something here without proving it, but uh, encouraging you to, to prove it. So here's a theorem. Let omega fp be a probability space. Like this one here, the general one <coughs> from last week. And let b be any event in f with probability of b being positive. Let me define a new function. Let me define a function q with a double bar, like for f. Um, and let me, it's not the rational numbers, it's, it's a q with a double bar, just like p um, up there. So this q um, is a function from f into the reals. And we define it by saying q of a is equal to the conditional probability of A given B. And my claim that I'm not going to prove, but that you can prove, 
is that omega f with q replacing p is also a probability space. OK, what do we have to do? Well, we haven't changed f. So I didn't write f axioms, but of course, the f axioms are automatically satisfied. What about the p axioms? We know they hold for p. What does it mean for them to hold for q? Well, it means that q of a has to be non-negative all the time. Well, with that definition, it is. q of omega has to be equal to 1. Well, with that definition, you can check that it is. And then uh, you can uh, think about uh, um, what it means to, to take um, disjoint sets and to wonder what is q of a plus q of b, etc. Um, it's a good way of, uh, of practicing um, to apply the axioms in two ways. One, we know the axioms hold for p, and the other, we need to prove them for q. So you're really seeing both ways of how the axioms really play a role in establishing that something is satisfying the axioms and in exploiting the axioms to do something new. Okay, and I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you.